Thank you. Thank you. I love that introduction. It was like, Kevin's great, and he plays video games. <laughs> That's all I got from that. <laughs> uh, so I want to invite everyone who has a smartphone or something like that, one, to silence it. Yeah. Uh, and two, uh, we are using Twitter now. It's a thing. And uh, if you want to live tweet this sermon, you can. And uh, I invited my brother to, and I know my brother is going to be uh, posting on Twitter. He's just going to be snarky and make fun of me. And if I slip up, he's going to call it out. So it's going to be fun. So feel free and make fun of me on Twitter. Uh, hashtag Lake Sam. So that's the thing. Um, it's going to work out better for me if we pray at the beginning instead of partway through like we do. So we're going to have John Platt pray for us. Yeah. So he's going to pray for us as a church and he's going to lift up another church as well. Lord, we come today in your name, um, united as one, with a focus on you, Lord. And as busy as we are during the week, remind us today to get started with the week ahead, to start every day with you, to have you at the center of everything that we do, and to have our hearts in the right place, Lord. And today I pray that, that your, your heart come through the message that Kevin has to pass on to us today. He really is a man of Christ. And um, please speak your, your message through him and what he has to share. And Lord, today I'd like to lift up uh, the churches back in my hometown in Corvallis, Oregon. Um, it's a very vibrant community, um, very diverse at the same time. And in particular for St. Mary's Church, which is where, um, where I grew up and where I first found you, Lord. And I pray that, that they may be guided by, um, by your word, your heart, and that everyone be reminded that they really are one in your view. Amen. Amen. Thanks, John. So, as Kurt mentioned, my name's Kevin. If you don't know me, I've been here for about two years, and uh, I'm on the worship steering team and on the worship team. Yeah, thanks, Adam, for that little woot. Um, I am married. Uh, Johanna is here. Hi, Johanna. Uh, I was going to make a joke about how she, this is a, my first sermon that she's been to because I, she didn't know if it was going to work out or some kind of thing, but she actually was at my last sermon, uh, so I can't make that joke, but no, it was there. Um, yeah, missed opportunity, right? Uh, so I grew up in the 90s, which is a great time. Any other 90s kids here? Yeah, represent. Uh, you remember Jinkos and MTV played music and, yeah. right? <laughs> uh, little, little stereo or uh, what are those called? Um, CD players, Walkman, yeah. Back in the day before MP3s, right? <laughs> Back in my day. Uh, and because I grew up in the 90s, that means I grew up on, on two things. One is the original NES, the Woo! Nintendo, right? The original Mario Brothers, the original Duck Hunt, back when games were simple and hard. <laughs> and uh, that also means that I grew up on cartoons. And I still watch cartoons. I still love cartoons. Um, and, but the, there are two cartoons in particular that I grew up watching. And these cartoons shaped my life as I know it. In fact, uh, every Halloween, I was one of these characters. Every time my brother and sister and I did make-believe, we make-believed as these characters. My dad actually got a video camera when they were, first came out, and he would follow us around, and he'd call them, uh, he called it KRS Films, which is my brother and sister and I's initials. And I got to play, like, mini-director. <laughs> and so I'd be like, all right, Dad, so here's what's going to happen. We're going to go into the living room. We're going to beat up all the invisible bad guys. We're going to run into the bathroom. That's when you cut the camera. And th then we'll set our next scene. Because the, the bathroom isn't the bathroom. It's like a sewer or it's like a new location. And so we'd kill the invisible bad guys. We'd run into the, the bathroom and I'd just yell out, end of the scene. And I'd kind of peek my head out. You're still rolling. <laughs> and finally he'd tear the camera off and we'd go. And of course these two shows, the Ninja Turtles and... Power Rangers. Is it up on my screen? Oh, my clicker's not working. It is on. Hey, 
Hey, there we go. How many of you look at that Ninja Turtles and you just automatically go, Cowabunga! <laughs> like, it just takes you back to those, those good, good old days where life was simple and heroes ran in single file to be taken down by the bad guy. <laughs> it was a simpler time then, in the 90s. And so, it's interesting to me, uh, when I was in first grade, uh, I was six years old, and I modeled my life after the Ninja Turtles and the Power Rangers, like you should. And in the playground, I saw a boy and a girl, and later I learned the boy was a fifth grader. I didn't know that at the time. And I saw them yelling at each other. So I, curious, thought I'd go check it out. A small crowd was forming around them, so okay, let's see what's going on. I'm six years old in first grade. And as I get closer, I notice the boy pushes the girl to the ground. And this is like during recess or whatever. And so having grown up on Ninja Turtles, I knew what had to be done. <laughs> so I walk up to a little six-year-old talking to this fifth crowd, and I go, hey, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and his response was something along the lines of, mind your own business, kid. Like, get out of here. You're six. Go play in the, eat the grass or something. Do what first graders do. And so I did the only thing that made sense to me, no, the only thing that was required of me, what the Ninja Turtles would do, what the Power Rangers would do, I punched him in the face. <laughs> this is a true story, I did. And shortly after, the teachers came and broke us up, and I, I'm not sure if I got suspended or if I just got sent home for the day, uh, but my dad got called and I got sent home, and as we were driving home, I remember my dad going, well... The school wasn't really happy with what you did. Um, you probably shouldn't punch people in the face. It might have been better to like, get a teacher involved or something like that. But I, I distinctly remember this moment where my dad said, Kevin, I'm not going to punish you because you will never get in trouble for standing up for what's right. And so even though punching someone in the face isn't the right course of action normally, there's something about standing up for what's right, standing up for the person who can't defend themselves. And that stuck with me even today. And that was influenced by Ninja Turtles. It's interesting, right? And isn't it interesting that every culture in the world, including ours, values this idea of a storyteller, someone who uh, passes the stories of the past to the next generation, someone who's responsible for teaching us lessons, and whether or not we agree with Hollywood or uh, the books we're reading or the video games we're playing, those different things, it's actually really important. Because these are the stories that we base our lives around. These are the stories that are informing us as to what's important and what's not important. These are the stories that uh, get us angry about certain issues or get us excited about certain things. So like it or not, it's here to stay and it's extremely important. In fact, you might say that we were wired this way. I don't know if you're the same as me, but as a whole, I don't learn through uh, systematic step-by-step -step instructions. And in fact, I think Jesus knew this, which is why the primary method he communicates through is parable, through story. Someone asks him, what is it like to love my neighbor? And he could say, well, it means this and that and you love your neighbor in this situation, but not this situation. She's your neighbor, he's your neighbor. Eh, you're a neighbor, you're a neighbor, you're, right? He could have done that. Instead, he says, so let me tell you a story about a man who was beaten. And then a Samaritan came and helped him. That's being a neighbor. And we don't have to have it explained to us. We don't have to have it broken down. And we just know, oh, that's what it means to be a neighbor. I should live my life that way. That's how life works. It's through story. You, you might say that we are narrative beings. That's how we learn. So when I was a kid, I learned of, of a story. Today, St. Patrick's Day. I learned of St. Patrick. You guys know the story of St. Patrick? He drank a lot and wore green, right? No. <laughs> uh, so St. Patrick essentially was a guy who was Ireland's missionary. And he came, and there are so many stories uh, around St. Patrick. Some say he... Um, chased snakes into the river, and that's why there are no snakes in Ireland, right? That's pretty cool. Some say he had a staff, and he could plant his staff into the ground, and he preached to people, and his sermons lasted so long that that staff became a tree. 
I don't know if that's a good reputation or not, but that's the story. Uh, some people say that he would sit with the, the heroes of Ireland and they would try and defend paganism and he would try and convert them to Christianity. The thing is, we don't know which of those stories are true and which of them are not true, right? Some of them, okay, maybe he kept, sent snakes into the river. I don't know about that. Maybe not. He probably didn't turn a, his staff into a sna uh, snake. No, uh, into a tree. But the point is that it doesn't really matter if it's true, historically accurate or not. Because when I'm a kid, I don't need to know the historical accuracy of St. Patrick. I need a role model who's going to tell me what's right and what's wrong. Or how many of you know the story of George Washington? And when he was a kid, he, his dad had a favorite cherry tree. And what did he do? He went out with a hatchet and chopped the tree down. And his dad, furious, came into the room and said, what happened to my tree? And he said, I cannot tell a lie, Father. It was me who chopped down the cherry tree with this hatchet. Did that actually happen? Maybe. Maybe not. But it doesn't really matter if it happened or not. Because as a kid, I need to know that this is what leaders are like. This is how life is, works for me. I need a role model that's honest. I need to know that being honest is better than lying. So story is extremely important, and it's probably the main way that we learn about truth and life and God. So we have this thing called the Bible, the Holy Scriptures. And when you look at the Scriptures, it's easy to say, okay, this is the story of uh, me and my past, or this is the story of our church and how it came to be, or this is the story of Israel. This is Israel's story. But if you look at the Bible from beginning to end, and you ask yourself, who's the main character in this story? Who is the uh, hero of the story? Who's the protagonist going through conflict and, and experiencing uh, growth in this story? The protagonist in the Bible is God. So it's interesting when we look at the Bible, it's not Israel's story. It's not the church's story. It's not your story and my story. It's God's story. So a question that you might ask yourself is, if this is God's story, what do I have to do with that? Is there a role for me in this story? And if it is, what does God want from me? And I think that's an honest question. And if you haven't asked yourself that, then it might be worth asking, what does God want from me? What's the point? All right, this is God's story, not Israel's story, not my story. Who cares? right? So there's a particular uh, story in the Bible that I want to point to uh, that is one of my favorite stories, showing how God works and how his people interact in his story. And so if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to the book of Amos, chapter 7. And I'll give you a moment to look in your table of contents for where Amos is. <laughs> it's that book between the Psalms and the New Testament that you skip over. It's okay. No judgment here. So while you're turning to Amos chapter 7, just a little history about uh, Israel. So, so Israel was originally 12 tribes, right? And uh, eventually they came to a point where they said, we want a king, we want monarchy. Bring on the monarchy. So we have King Saul. And he gets kind of a bad rap because ultimately he didn't follow God. But one of the things that he did right was he took the 12 divided tribes and brought them together. So under the reign of King Saul, now we have monarchy. Now we have the kingdom of Israel. Awesome. They're now united. So the next king is our favorite, our, our man David, King David. And David took the kingdom that was established and aggressively expanded it. He expanded the borders. He grew it economically. He grew it culturally. He wrote a bunch of psalms. Like, David took the, the kingdom of Israel and made it awesome. In fact, historians and rabbis to this day look at the reign of King David and say that was the golden age of Israel. That was when they were at their best. They, it wasn't as good before him, and it hasn't been as good since. And there, there's legitimacy to that claim, I think. So then his, he had a son, King Solomon. And we know a lot about King Solomon, but what he did was he essentially took that wealth and invested it. And he made Israel beautiful. 
You might say he brought the bling to Israel. He took everything and he just put gold on it. Like he's like, temple, gold. Your spear, that's nice. Let's add some gold to that. Just because. It's not heavy enough. Uh, shield, gold. Walls, gold. Gold everywhere. And to the point that kings and queens would come to Israel and they'd say, wow, God must have blessed you. There's gold everywhere. This is pretty, right? Uh, th- that's awesome, right? So he took uh, the, what David did and made it something else, made it bigger and better. So then he had some sons, and they didn't really know who was going to be king, and they didn't really want the other brother to be king, and a civil war broke out, and that divided the kingdom of Israel into two parts. And I have a, a slide here that shows uh, how the Israel turned out. Ten of the 12 tribes formed what is called the Northern Kingdom, and they r- retained the name Israel. So post-Solomon in the Bible, when you, when you see the word Israel, usually they're referring to these uh, ten tribes, this Northern Kingdom. And then the other two tribes uh, formed what's called the Southern Kingdom, and they called themselves Judah. So post-Solomon, when you see Judah, usually they're referring to this Southern Kingdom. And the Northern Kingdom of Israel never had a good king. None of their kings followed after God. All of them were wicked. You can, if you read First and Second Kings, you can read the story of the kings and how terrible they were and how they led everyone away from God. They worshipped idols. They essentially be, turned Israel into a pagan nation. And Judah wasn't much better, by the way. They had maybe four, five, maybe six good kings, depending on how you define a king who follows after God. So you have these two kingdoms, and then you have Amos, who's a guy from Judah, the southern kingdom. And God calls him to prophesy in the northern kingdom of Israel. And you can see on my map here, I have uh, the beginning of Amos' prophecy. He goes into Israel, and he, he says, the kingdom of Damascus, that northern blip up there, God is going to judge them for their wickedness. God is going to punish them. And Israel's like, yes, we like that. Maybe we can aggressively expand again. This would be awesome. And then he says, oh, that southern, that Gaza in the bottom left there, uh, God says, I will punish them for their wickedness and their sins. And Israel's like, yeah, that's awesome. We could establish a trade route there maybe. We could, we could go there. That'll be awesome. Yes, this is good. And then he curves back around and says, oh, that northern uh, Tyre, that kingdom of Tyre, God's going to punish them for their wickedness too. Like, hey, no more enemies in the north. This is great. God is doing something awesome by punishing these people. This is amazing. And he, oh, yeah, and that kingdom of Ammon there, punished. Wickedness. Yes. Almost all of our borders are going to be secure because God is going to punish all these nations. Moab, punished. Wickedness. God's going to bring them down too. Edom, forget them. God's going to punish them. And then, Finally, he goes, oh, and by the way, the kingdom of Judah, God is going to punish them for their sins and their wickedness. And Israel would be like, finally, finally they get what they deserve. It's about time, God, it's about time you showed up and punished that wicked nation of Judah. And I don't know if Amos had a moment where he had to kind of pause and compose himself, look over at the king, kind of all right, I need to say this. The kingdom of Israel, God is going to punish you for your wickedness. And if you read the first chapter, or the first few chapters of Amos, a chapter and a half is devoted to God punishing all the nations surrounding Israel, including Judah. The next four and a half chapters are in detail of Israel, you're going down, here's why. You were not good. You were following all these... Other gods, you're terrible. Be prepared. God is not happy with you. And so if you look at the focus, the focus is all on Israel and how not following God they are. That's a verb now, not following God. So we pick up in Amos chapter 7. God gives Amos these visions of how he's going to destroy Israel. And Amos goes, God, you can't destroy them like that. We're too small. We won't survive if you do that. And so God relents. And then God relents. And then God relents. And then we pick up in verse 7 of chapter 7, where it says, And then he showed me another vision. 
I saw the Lord standing beside a wall that had been built using a plumb line. A plumb line, this is a crude version of a plumb line. Essentially, you hold a plumb line up. It's just a weight attached to a string. You hold it up and you say, based on gravity, is this straight? And this table doesn't look like it's entirely straight, so if you can get on that, that'd be great. Uh, <laughs> kidding. <laughs> kidding, everyone. So I saw the Lord standing beside a wall that had been built using a plumb line. He was using a plumb line to see if it was still straight. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? I answered, a plumb line. And the Lord replied, I will test my people with this plumb line. I will no longer ignore all their sins. The pagan shrines of your ancestors will be ruined and the temples of Israel will be destroyed. I will bring the dynasty of King Jeroboam to a sudden end. So now it's personal. Now the king is involved, and he's going to bring down the king. So then Amaziah, a priest of Bethel, sent a message to Jeroboam, king of Israel. Amos is hatching a plot against you right here on your very doorstep. What he is saying is intolerable. He's saying Jeroboam will soon be killed, and the people of Israel will be sent away into exile. Then Amaziah sent orders to Amos. Get out of here, you prophet. Go on back to the land of Judah and earn your living by prophesying there. Don't bother us with your prophecies here in Bethel. This is the king's sanctuary and the national place of worship. So Amos gives this prophecy against Israel, and their response is, get out of here. Go to Judah, where you're from, and you can earn your living there. That's fine. We don't care if you prophesy, just don't do it here. Almost, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. And then in this next moment, Amos' response is really interesting uh, because in a sense, it's almost like a plot twist. It's a moment where he reveals information that previously we didn't know. So Amos' response, he replied, I'm not a professional prophet. I was never trained to be one. I'm just a shepherd, and I take care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord called me away from my flock and told me, go and prophesy to my people in Israel. So that great big prophet who's prophesying against all these nations, just a shepherd, no big deal. He just takes care of sheep. Taking care of sycamore fig trees is interesting too because all you really do is the tree bears fruit and you take a knife of some kind and you slash the fruit to cause it to ripen. This is fruit ninja at its finest. <laughs> so... He's not a professional prophet. He wasn't paid to do this. He wasn't trained to do this. In Israel, if you were a shepherd, that means your kids are shepherds, and their kids are shepherds, and their kids are shepherds. So he didn't come from this line of prophets. He came from this line of shepherds. And if you are a fairly uh, knowledgeable reader of the Bible, you, you think of shepherds and you go, ah, King David, he was a shepherd. He turned out okay. Like the people who... Uh, were shepherds were the people were the first people to see Jesus when he was born. So we, we have this idea of shepherds that they're like awesome and amazing, right? Really, shepherds weren't that highly desired or sought after. It wasn't exactly a cush job. In fact, if you were to compare them to something of today, you might compare them to like a ditch digger. And it, if there's any ditch diggers here, that's not a criticism against ditch digging. But society doesn't value that very highly. Like, you don't raise your kids up and say, man, I really hope they become a ditch digger, right? And that's, a, that's the same idea with shepherds. They're not, it's not like, awesome, my kid's a shepherd just like I was. This is great. They're going to live in a small town and watch sheep. Awesome. But Amos had a moment in the midst of this boring Job, boring life, slashing fruit, watching sheep. There was a moment where God called him and said, Amos, I have a story that needs to be told, and I want you to be a part of it. See, God's story required a word to Israel. And so Amos was invited into that story. And I think that's that same invitation that you and I have as we are sitting on the couch watching TV or playing video games, right? Or as we're working our day-to-day -day job, 
as we're going to the movies, as we're playing golf, as we're doing the thing we do that is life. There's that moment where God says, my story requires you. This, this story, I, I have this great story arc planned for you. You're not the main character here, but there's definitely a part for you. And the thing about Amos that is so encouraging to me is Amos wasn't trained for that. It's not like he was in, like, sitting there with his sheep, like, I'm going to practice public speaking. Okay, sheep, just stand there. You're my congregation. I'm going to practice this sermon here. I've been working on this. Oh, hold on. I've got to slash this fruit before it ripens. All right. Like, he's just a shepherd. He didn't, he didn't plan for this. He didn't train for this. It's not like he aspired to be a public speaker and a pastor. He didn't play make-believe with the trees like, you're judged, you're judged, you're judged. Judgment on you for your wickedness, sycamore fig trees. He's just a, just a guy that God called. We've been in this series called Encounter, or Empower. I don't know what the series is called. It was a cool graphic that Kurt always mentions because it is really cool. And the thing about being empowered is it's two parts, really. There's a moment when you're living your average, everyday life where God calls you, where God says, it's time, step up. And that's when you begin that empowerment of the Holy Spirit. But there's a second part. And there's that moment when you're there, now I'm standing before the king, crap, I wasn't trained for this, what do I do now? You're empowered, oh, that's not there anymore, awesome. Yeah, Uh, (laughs) you get empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's where the Spirit comes in, right? The Holy Spirit in you is the one doing the thing. Because it's not your story, it's God's story. God is living inside you. So in that moment, it's not about you, it's about God. It's about God and his story. I wonder if that's why in Luke, Jesus says, now go and remember that I'm sending you out as lambs among wolves. Don't take any money with you, nor a traveler's bag, nor an extra pair of sandals, and don't stop to greet anyone on the road. Essentially, he took 72 of his disciples and said, you're filled with the Holy Spirit, go. These are not rabbis. These are not public speakers. These are not salesmen. These are fishermen. These are tax collectors, prostitutes. These are, these are the people who Jesus interacted with that now have the Holy Spirit, and they, he says, go. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, my story requires you to go out. And the response is, when the 72 disciples returned, they joy, joyfully reported to him, Lord, even the demons obey us when we use your name. Yes, he told them. I saw Satan fall, like, fall from heaven like lightning. Look, I've given you authority over all the power of the enemy, and you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you. But don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. Rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. In other words, he's saying, what you're doing is awesome, but remember, this is not your story. You don't get the credit for this. This is God's story. Rejoice because this is God's story and you're involved in God's story. There, there's a moment when he calls you, and I don't know if you're like me, but there's that moment of, ah, that's a lot, of, that's a lot to do, God. I don't know if I can prophesy to Israel. I don't know if I can stand before the king and say what you want me to say. But it's not your story. You might be here saying, "Ah, I'm too young. I'm not qualified for that. But you're not too young because it's not your story. It's God's story. You might be here saying, I'm too old for that. I've been following God. I've done all that stuff. It's time for me to move out of the way and let the youngsters do it, right? But you're not too old for that. It's not your story. It's God's story. You might say, I don't have the education required for that. I went to Bible college. I have no education that, that is helpful outside of this building. But that doesn't matter because it's not your story. It's not my story. It's God's story. You might say, I'm too poor. I don't have the resources available to do that. But it's not your story. It's God's story, and God has the resources available. You might say, 
the scriptures criticize the rich. I'm probably too rich for that. If that's your problem, talk to me afterwards. I'm happy to help with that. <laughs> but it's, ultimately, it's not your story. It's God's story. And there's this weird theological thing that we get into. It's, in college, this is a, a common topic of debate. And it's, if I don't respond, does God's will still get done? And there are people on both sides, and there's scripture on both sides of the issue. On one hand, God has chosen to limit himself to us, to his people. So there's a sense of, if you don't do what God is asking you to do, God's will will not happen in your life. Then there's this other, the other side of it, is there's this woman named Esther. And she was put in a place of power. And there's a moment where it's time for her to step up, where God needs her to respond. And she doesn't know if she can do it. And her uncle's wisdom to her is, if you don't do this, someone else will. If you don't step into God's story, God will raise up someone else and will get his will done. And I don't know if you're like me, but the thought of that terrifies me. The thought of, if I don't step up, why am I even here? Is it possible that you are exactly where you're supposed to be because God wants to use you? And maybe if you say no, his will won't happen. And that scares me. But what scares me more is the idea that I'm just useless and God will use someone else because I wasn't willing to step up. Can you imagine a story what a story would be like if the hero decided not to step up. I, I re- recently rewatched Princess Bride. Fanta- Again, 90s, great movie. What would happen if the princess got captured by Humperdinck and Wesley was just like, well, guess that's over. <laughs> there are more women out there. <laughs> I'll fall in love again. Take a ship and go. Roll credits, right? That would be terrible. That'd be a terrible story. We'd, we'd watch the end of that. We'd rip the DVD in half, throw it out of the window, and be like, that was a terrible story. You played with my emotions. You can't do that. Or like, if you're watching the Batman movies, and in that third one where you have Bane who captures Batman and is like, I'm taking over Gotham, and, and Batman's just like, okay. <laughs> like, he just <laughs> takes it, like, all right, whatever. Someone else will ra- be raised up. It's fine. It's been a tough life, right? Or did you see the, the latest James Bond movie? Where he's like in Hawaii or somewhere, and he's just relaxing and drinking and be, getting hungover, and that's his whole... What if the movie was just like, nope, I don't think I'll respond to that. I'm cool here. Roll credits. That's a terrible movie. It's a terrible story. Or I actually have a video clip for you that shows this is what happens if... God begins a story with you, and you choose not to respond. Uh, Good morning. Uh, Many of you are halfway through your first week here at Greendale, and uh, as your dean, I thought I would share a few thoughts of wisdom and inspiration. What is community college? Well, you've heard all kinds of things. You've heard it's loser college for remedial teens, 20-something dropouts, middle-aged divorcees, and old people keeping their minds active as they circle the drain of eternity. That's what you heard. However, I wish you luck. (laughs) Okay, you know, uh uh-oh. Okay, there's more to this speech. There's actually a middle card that is missing. Can we all look around our immediate areas? Because I really wanted to. See what happens if you don't respond. <laughs> that sucks. <laughs> That's embarrassing. <laughs> See, there's slightly more to it than that to me. Because if I don't respond to what God's doing, and ultimately I am saying no to him, ultimately this relationship isn't what we, I thought it was, isn't what he thought it was. Because it's supposed to be a relationship, right? It's a relationship with God. I don't think God wants us to uh, 
read his word and follow this strict moral code, and that's it. There's an element of morality involved in following God, but that's not the point. Or if we were to just study and memorize all the scripture and have everything committed to memory, that'd be awesome. But that's not really the point. Like, if you've ever, hopefully no one in this room has this experience, but if you've ever learned everything there is to know about someone and you don't actually know them, that's called being a stalker. (laughs) Right? If you have this imaginary uh, relationship with someone and they don't know about it, that's stalking. It's like when two people go on a walk and only one of them knows about it. That's a problem. If we're not willing to say yes to God, that's exactly what our relationship with God is like. He's not calling us to simply live a life of morality. He's not calling us to simply just memorize his word and learn the facts about God. He's inviting us on an adventure. He's inviting us to be a part of his story. Right? He's, there's that moment in the midst of life where he's saying, it's time. And if you've ever uh, interviewed Uh, or heard an interview of an actor or a public speaker or a pastor, there's this moment where you're you're about to step up, and and it's that they're introducing you you now, so it's it's about time. And you have this moment where you just forget that you're not qualified to do this. And you forget that you weren't trained for this. You forget you're not good enough. You forget that you're terrible. And there's this moment where you just go, I got this. And it has to happen. Otherwise, Actors and uh, public speakers and pastors would just get up here and fail completely. There's this moment of, yes, it's time. Let's do this. And my heart and and God's heart is that when that moment comes where God says, it's time. You ready to stop being a shepherd? You ready to be a prophet? You forget all those reasons why you can't and forget all those things that make you not qualified and that little voice telling you you're not good enough to do this. Because you are, because it's not your story. It's God's story. And he wants to involve you, and he wants to empower you. It's interesting, uh, Twitter and Facebook have done a really interesting thing. They uh, have given the average, ordinary, everyday person followers. Like at the beginning of this sermon, I said, hey, you should go on Twitter and live tweet this because I have followers. There are people actually following me as a human being, and I can tweet out to my followers anything I want. And what do I spend my time tweeting to them? Pictures of food, movie commentary. (laughs) Well, this sucks. Those kind of thoughts, right? It's really dangerous to have the responsibility of followers and not really have anything worth following. What if we were a community that had a story worth following? What if we did things that people would say, I want to follow that? It's not just pictures of food. It's not just game commentary, movie commentary. It's something worth following. That's exactly what God's inviting us to. A life worth following. A story worth telling. Maybe we can have such a story that years from now, people will say, well, here's what the story is. I don't know if this is true or not, but it really doesn't matter if it's true because this is a story worth living our life around. This story informs us of how we ought to live. This story uh, teaches us something important. Those are the kinds of stories that God is inviting you and inviting me to. And it doesn't start here. Maybe it does start here, but it doesn't play out here at Lake Sam on Sunday morning. It starts out there when you hear that still, small, quiet voice slowly draw you into God's story. So Lord, this morning, we want to be drawn into your story. We want to go on an adventure with you. 
And it's not about morality. It's not about trying to please you. It's not about memorizing facts about you. It's about going on this exciting journey with you. Lord, you, you are the one who calls us to be a part of your story, and you're also the one who makes that happen. Would you take that voice of fear in us that says we're not good enough, that says we're too young or too old or too poor or too uneducated or whatever, too whatever that, that we tell ourselves that we can't do it. And would you just make that go away? Would you remind us that we got this? Lord, we want to be a part of your story. We want to be like Esther who stepped up. We want to be like your disciples who stepped up. We want to be like Amos. Not educated enough to do it. Not a professional prophet. Not trained to do it. But willing to be a part of something greater. Be a part of your story. So we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name.